Let's talk about pickup patterns now. The most common ones are cardioid, omnidirectional, supercardioid, and figure eight. I'll talk about pickup patterns in detail in another video. The two most important things to remember is that cardioid means it picks up sound mostly in one direction. Omnidirectional pattern microphones pick up sounds in mostly all directions. Figure eight picks up sound in front and in back of the capsule. The most common accessory you'll run into is the microphone clip, and that is where you mount your microphone onto so that that can be mounted onto a stand. Another form of a clip is called a shock mount, and this is actually a more advanced and better form of mounting, and this basically minimizes any movement of the microphone, which will result in microphone noises happening. Mic clips and shock mounts have different thread sizes, I believe there's two common ones because you'll get the standard thread size that goes on pretty much all the stands I've ever used. And then there's also a thread adapter, which I'll show on the screen right now, which is a smaller mount. So if you have a stand that requires that, then yeah, get an adapter. Every microphone clip or shock mount needs a stand, with the exception of lavalier clips. Anyway, there's always an exception to every rule. There are straight microphone stands that go up and down. A boom stand features an arm that allows you to position microphones a lot easier than straight stands. Tabletop stands are perfect for desks and tables. And finally, you have gooseneck stands that allow for even more precise positioning versus a boom or straight stand. The vast majority of stands feature collapsible parts so that you can store and transport them a lot easier. The better stands are longer, heavier, and therefore can support more weight. They're also typically more expensive. A counterbalance weight may be necessary when using a boom stand. You can also drape sandbags over the stand legs so that they don't fall over. Earlier I talked about condenser microphones having built-in pads. These are also called attenuators or inline attenuators. Some microphones and audio interfaces have built-in pads, which are great features to have. What these things do is they bring down input signal levels so that you can record louder sources. One day you run into an instrument that is too loud, even when your input knob is set all the way counterclockwise. That's when an attenuator will become necessary. Otherwise, you'll clip or distort your input. If your microphone has a built-in pad, use that first. My favorite inline attenuator is the one pictured from Audio-Technica, the model AT8202. It features three different settings and it doesn't audibly affect the quality of the signal. Click on the box on screen if you want to check out a review I did on it. Next up, direct boxes. These are also known as direct inputs, direct injection, or high Z inputs. High Z refers to high impedance. They're commonly used to record the signal of an acoustic guitar, electric guitar, bass guitar, or keyboard. They translate an instrument signal to a microphone signal. Otherwise, it sounds weird and doesn't work properly. Standalone direct boxes like the Radial J48 or Countryman Type 85 offer more recording flexibility and possibly better quality than built-in instrument inputs. If you use an interface's direct input or DI, like the Triton Big Amp, you can't record a guitar speaker along with a direct signal. Another common accessory is the windscreen, and basically what this does is it minimizes what's known as plosives, and that is that noise that you hear anytime somebody uses a word that starts with P or B and sometimes T, it will reduce that B sound that sounds awful and unprofessional. The best windscreens can handle a lot of wind noise. Windscreens also 
as their name suggests, reduce any wind noise that you may pick up if you record outdoors. A pop filter is basically an advanced windscreen. You stick it in front of a microphone, and in the case of the Stedman Pro Screen, it redirects the air downwards so no air at all hits the microphone capsule. It's a brilliant design. I highly recommend it if you record vocals, which pretty much all of us will at some point. It doesn't work on stage. It doesn't look aesthetically pleasing for stage, but in the studio, it works a treat. As for lavalier windscreens, I absolutely recommend the Bubble Bee. I did a review on that. Click on the box on screen to see it. And I also reviewed the Stedman Pro Screen XL in another video. Minimizing electronic noise is crucial to great sound quality. Power conditioners give a pure, less noisy signal than what you'll get from directly plugging into a wall outlet. This is especially true in older houses or houses with incorrectly wired electric. Furman is probably the most well-known power conditioner company. A Furman SS6B power strip is affordable at around $40 or less. Combine that with a battery backup unit for power outages and you're good to go. Furman also offers rack mountable power strips as well that have more features. I've seen Furman gear in use at various music venues behind the scenes. I can't vouch for their quality personally, but I can say that they do make a difference. The power strip that I'm using right now for my computer features noise filtering and I can definitely hear a difference through my speakers versus plugging directly into the wall outlet. Speaking of racks, there's something that you're gonna run into along your audio recording and production journey. Some desks even have built-in rack spaces, which is pretty cool. I don't personally own a rack because I don't have enough gear to rack, so I can't recommend specific brands. Racks are a video topic all unto their own, which I may do in a future video, but for now, like I said, I don't own a rack, so I can't really vouch for anything. Another accessory that you may want to look into are microphone level boosters. These are relatively newcomers to the audio scene. The Cloud Microphones Cloud Lifter series and the Radial Mic Boost are two ones that I recommend. I think they might actually be the only ones that are out there right now. As I said earlier, dynamic microphones oftentimes have low input pickups. This includes ribbon microphones. A microphone level booster takes advantage of phantom power and boosts the signal strength without adding any extra noise. Just make sure that you use a short cable between the microphone and the booster, three feet or less. Oftentimes, cheaper audio interfaces don't have enough preamp power or the preamps are too noisy at higher levels. These accessories are really great to own. I'll get to what preamps are later in the video. Next up, I like to call this category the source. That is your room choice, the position in the room that you put your performer or your instrument, microphone placement. These are all topics that are better suited for more detailed videos, but the best advice I can give you is to experiment because every room is different, every instrument is different, and the idea is that you want to get whatever your goal that you have in mind, get that. Typically, a home studio recording engineer will take advantage of close mic placement, and that tends to minimize any reverb in rooms with bad acoustics. But like I said, experimenting is key. The other piece of advice I would give you is to record at night because you tend to have less traffic noise. You tend to have less noise in general. It's just quieter to record in. And the idea is you always want to minimize most noise, unless you're doing some kind of avant-garde thing and whatever. Oh yeah, my favorite topic, well not really, uh, DAWs, which is short for Digital Audio Workstations, and we have our favorite thing, which is the Audio Interface Driver. Well... 
I actually have more in-depth tutorials about these, and I can just tell you that the most used, most universal doll is called Pro Tools from Avid. The one that I use is Reaper by a company called Kakos. Two other common dolls are Apple's Logic Pro and Steinberg's Cubase 